Hi, I'm Carl Scavazzo, and you're banging your head on Focus on Metal. Hey, Metalhead, Scott Thompson here, welcoming you to another dose of Focus on Metal. And no, no Carlos this week. We instead have bassist Chuck Wright. Yeah, I didn't really have an ID for Chuck. And then it was, okay, I could be a smartass and put a Rudy Sarzo one up there and uh, do that. So one bass player for another bass player. Then I decided, you know what, I'm going to check Carlos on the front end. So there you go. But this week we are talking to Chuck Wright. And for those of you that uh, aren't really familiar with Chuck, kind of like the uh, the kid that was doing the uh, autographs for uh, the documentary there for Quiet Riot, well, now you're here. That uh, Yep, Chuck, he came to prominence in uh, Jafria, and he is the bass player on the uh, that single Call to the Heart. And he left Jafria in, I think, around 86 to hook back up with Quiet Riot, and he is uh, he is on the Metal Health album, at least on Metal Health, and uh, Don't Want to Let You Go. So he is on that 1983 release, but then, uh, you know, goes on his way, goes to Jafria. Most people real- think that uh, it's Rudy on Metal Health for all of it and isn't, which is why I said you get that classic scene where that uh, kid doesn't want Chuck's autograph because he's like, yeah, but you're not on the album. I just, I felt so bad for Chuck in that scene. But anyways, goes from Jafria around 86, hooks back up with Quiet Riot again uh, in time for the QR3 release. He plays with them for a while. He's also uh, hooks up with House of Lords from, uh, from 88 onward there. But he's also, so he's on House of Lords. He's on Sahara. Then uh, there's a few other ones from there as well. He's also played with Heaven and Earth. But he has been just on a crap load of different recordings. Ted Nugent, uh, Impelitary, Pat Travers, Superstition album. He's on that one. Like I said, if you want, go look him up and uh, Google him and you will just see an amazing, amazing array of albums. This guy is definitely somebody who is in major demand by all kinds of folks. And besides the recorded output, you know, all the touring stuff he's done as well. Chuck's going to talk this week about time out touring with uh, with Alice Cooper, but he's also toured with a crap load of other people. But also the reason Chuck is on the show is that he has just put out a uh, a new album on Cleopatra Records called Chuck Wright's Sheltering Sky. And he's got all kinds of people on here. And it's not just the typical stuff that you would expect from Chuck. So he was going to get into that. You're going to get a real good feel about that. But he's got folks from, you know, Mr. Big and Skid Row, Jane's Addiction, Asia, just all kinds of people on this album with him. And it's actually even been uh, been nominated for a couple of different things. And Chuck will get into all of that as well. And I really shouldn't say just came out because this has actually been out since uh, since May. But you can pick this up on Amazon. You can pick it up at uh, Cleopatra Records online store as well. And you'll also see up there tons of reviews for this as well. He's got some really, really good reviews for this. So it's really great to have Chuck on the show. He has got tons of stories and honestly, there's been there's a few things that during the interview that he thought about over like the next 24, 48 hours, hit Richie back and said, hey, would you mind snipping this and snipping that? And so, you know, we always try to do that. You know, we get a guest on. We never like to shit on a guest. So if someone says, hey, you know, I thought better about something I said, would you mind? We always uh, comply with those wishes because these guys are given their own time to come on and, and we have to show our appreciation and our respect so uh, so we do that. And as longtime listeners know, we've never really been into, you know, utilizing artist statements as clickbait to generate more traffic or any of that kind of tactic. But even with all that great stuff from Chuck this week, hope you guys enjoy it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Richie and Chuck Wright. Hi, is that Chuck? Hey, Richie. Yes, it is. How are you? I'm OK. Do you have a favorite country just in general, Chuck, to visit? Maybe maybe one that, you know, you went there with a band and you didn't get enough time to really 
look around well, and you said, right, I want to go back? Well, recently, um, yeah, there's a couple, like, I'd like to spend more time in Stockholm and Copenhagen, Amsterdam. Um, but this past summer, I was able to, you know, I've always loved Barcelona and I've had this vision board of postcards and, and, um, and I, I've found that when I envision certain things that they actually happen, I can give you a few examples, but, um, I had, a, a postcards of Barcelona that I looked at all the time because I really loved it the short time I was there. And this summer I, I was there four times. Wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it was awesome. The Sagrada Familia and all the Gaudi. I just, it's just the food. I, I can go on and on and on. It's really, uh, <laughs> Barcelona is awesome. But yeah, um, it's hard. To, you know what? It's hard to pick one. The weather down in Spain um, is very similar to here. So I probably, I really like Mallorca a lot as well. Um, you know, the island of Mallorca. It was, it's really cool. Is it over the years, has it been frustrating as a musician? that you're in and out of a lot of these places. Is that something you just get used to? Yeah, you do. You know, the, th the difference between, I think, between me and a lot of guys, which really baffles me, is that, um, you know, for instance, I was on tour with Alice Cooper, um, and we did 75 cities, 17 countries, um, started in Moscow and ended in Lisbon. And I made it a point. I would get out and see, you know, take whatever hours or a day or whatever I had and get out and see and take photos as much as I can. I go, I might not ever be in this place again, but a lot of guys I've toured with and many of the bands I've been in, they just stay in their hotel. I don't get it. I don't understand why, you know, maybe they're just not interested in culture or, being enriched in that way, but but um, I really try to get out and and even if I'm tired, you know, from the travel or whatever, I'll still force myself to get out. I had um, we were in Switzerland, surrounded by I think eight or nine um, waterfalls in this chalet type village, and I was having foot trouble, pain, but I didn't care. I just I just walked through it and and walked up to one of the waterfalls, and it just you know for me. You know that's 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 what why it makes me feel rich is that I'm rich in experience. I've never made a ton of money doing rock and roll, but I, I'm rich in friendships and rich in experiences and seeing the world. It's kind of priceless, I think. Yeah, Chuck, did you ever play golf with Alice Cooper? You know what? I'm a terrible golfer. Um, <laughs> the one time I the one time I did a, a golf tournament, it came to the first hole. It was a shotgun type thing where everybody started i was with meatloaf actually on that one and um they introduced me from house of lords quiet riot chuck riot and i do my drive and i hit it right in the crowd and almost took this girl's face off so. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so so no but you know what when we started our tour um we were doing pre-production and and alice um you know we were doing it up i think in south dakota or north dakota and and uh in an outdoor venue and he he did the pro-am and won it that was happening that day. He goes, yeah, I entered the pro am. I got the trophy. Anybody want it? I mean, that's the way he was. He would love to, um, you know, I'd go shopping with him a lot and, and Alice loved to find a deal like, Oh, look at the deal. This is great. I'm going to get this. And then he would show everybody backstage, you know, you, I look at what I got this for. But, and you know, talked about the item and how cheap, how, what a great deal he got on it. And then he'd give it away. Wow. You know, yeah, he, he's awesome that way. I mean, that was a highlight of my life was touring with that band, that, that kind of production. I'm really into big production. It's kind of like being in a, a rock musical Broadway show, you know, that was heavy. We did a lot of heavier music because we we're doing the Descent into Dragontown tour. So the first part of that show was was the heavier music that he was into at the time. And and then we, uh, you know, then we would break it up with the drum solo and do... Uh, do a lot of the other stuff, you know, no more Mr. Nice Guy and, you know, Welcome to My Nightmare mm. and that kind of thing. Chuck, who was in his band when you were in it, or you were in it? Oh, it was a great band and uh, most of the guys are still good friends of mine. Um, the drummer, uh, this is how it came about, it was because of the drummer. The drummer's Eric Singer, you know, from ah, Kiss. Yeah, yeah. Him and I were both in Montrose, uh, you know, with Ronnie, playing mm -hmm. with Ronnie Montrose. In fact, um, Eric came in replacing my late friend Pat Torpy. And um, Eric said, "Hey, listen, man. Um, you know we're going to be checking out bass players for Alice Cooper. Do you want? Are you interested? And, you know, and Ronnie was only doing sporadic shows and not really doing a lot. And um, you know, the Alice tour was going to be huge. And, and uh, I said, "Yeah, I'll come. I'll check it out." And you know, it was between me and Chuck Garrick 
I, and I got the gig and then Chuck now is the bass player. I rejoined Quiet Riot, but, um, he, uh, he's the guy now, but, um, so it was Eric Singer on drums, uh, my friend Eric Dover, who you might know from Slash's yeah. uh, Snake Pit and mm-hmm. Jellyfish, um, and then uh, my good friend Teddy Zigzag, who you might know from Guns N' Roses, was on keyboards, and a guitar player who, who's in England, who I haven't really been in touch with since then, is named Pete Friesen from The Almighty. Yeah, I know Pete, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he's great. I mean, that was a killer band. I wish there was really well-recorded live footage of it, but most of the footage I've been able to find from that tour is somebody with a phone, you know, back in the day, and the phone's back, you know, that was, what, 20 years ago. They were, weren't as good as near what they are now as mm. far as the quality, uh, picture quality. We did one TV show um, in England that's on YouTube that actually I just discovered, and it was uh, it was for a charity, and Roger Taylor introduced us. It was, it was cool. You bring up tours now that, you know, weren't professionally filmed, there must be other tours you did over the years that weren't professionally filmed, and you look back on now and you think, "Damn, I wish we would have done one, done a, a video for that." Well, you know what, I I do, but but in this day and age, which what we always comment on, it's a double edged sword because you know you will do a, a show and then before you even get off stage, it's already posted on YouTube yeah. and you know usually poorly recorded you know all distorted and the shot the shot it's like you have no control over what's out there and there's usually a lot of videos out there from that one show um but to have it professionally done um yeah i would there's a bunch that i would really love to do that i mean chafria uh when i was we did do a professional one um in japan when that was actually my last i think it was my next to last show with them before i rejoined quiet riot back in uh 86 um but that was out there, and it's good too. Craig Goldie was what a brilliant guitar player, you know. Yeah, <laughs> he left to join Dio, and I left to join Quiet Riot again. Rudy had left uh, again. You know, I've been in and out of that band like five or six times. I can't even keep counting anymore. But anyway, um, it, you know, Kevin called me and said, "Hey, you know, Rudy's leaving. Do you want to join? And 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 uh, you can you know work the tunes with us." And the reason both Goldie and I left Jafria because Jafria just finished doing sold out tour with. Deep Purple and Foreigner, and we were headlining in Japan. We really had a lot of momentum. We had a hit single. Um, but the the problem was that Greg Jafria and the singer, David Glenn Isley, who's still a close friend of mine, David, um, they just said, hey, we're the we're the songwriters, you know. So basically they said, you guys are just side guys. So, you know, I'm on a songwriter. I mean, I have a solo album out now, and I think most people will be amazed at the diversity of it and, and check it out. But, um, yeah, so we left that band because of that. Hmm. One of the questions I've been asking all the guitarists, and I'm doing the show 10 years, and I've never interviewed you before, um, how many guitars do you have in your house? Oh, I'm not, you know, I I am not an electric guitar player, really. I mean, I play acoustic, like on my record, I'm playing 12 string and uh, some classical, you know, gut string guitar and a regular steel string guitar. Um, I'm not really an electric guitar player, but I, you know, I'm a bass player. I, yeah. I, there's one song, there's one song called Farewell Horizon, um, there's two instrumentals, and this particular instrumental, uh, "Farewell Horizon," has three basses on it. At the, you know, playing, and and they all make perfect sense the way it all works together. Um, it's pretty interesting, but yeah, um, I did see that you had my good friend Doug Aldridge uh, on your show not too long ago. Oh, I love Doug, great guy. Yeah, Doug's. I I still think, and you know, I, I did the Bad Moon Rising record with him, and and he was on ninety five percent of the. Uh, House of Lords of Hair record and toured with us. I think his solo in our remake of Can't Find My Way Home is, is still one of his most brilliant moments. Yeah, um, yeah. And if you listen, if, you know, it's just one of those solos. It's just like, oh my God, you know? Yeah. It's just uh, spectacular. But yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, he's, I haven't seen him in a while. You know, he's so busy that that band he's in, uh, the Dead Daisies, keeps him so busy. It's crazy. Yeah, the great band. The new album. Yeah, well, how can you not? How can you not be with, you know, when you have Glenn Hughes now? Well, I mean, they were great anyway with, with Karabi and, and Marco Mendoza, who's a good friend of mine, who's a, one of the best bass players on the planet. You know, and he sings his ass off. So it's like that was, you know, they they have the funding to be able to do whatever they want to do. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I would love that. I would love that. Um, when people listen to my, my album, they, you know, they, they go, wow, it's really cinematic and it's really 
deep and it's so diverse and all this stuff. What do you think about touring it? I go, I need Roger Waters' budget to be able to tour this album. <laughs> you know, there's, I, you know, I have 41 guest musicians on it and singers and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very deep. I, I worked with, um, a friend of mine who's an award winning, um, film composer and he's, he also mixed and engineered, um, five of the tunes and co-produced five of the tunes with me, so, it, which lends itself to having such a cinematic feel to it. I mean, I was already into that to begin with. I love that kind of thing, and, and it feels like a conceptual record um, when you listen to it top to bottom. But um, that's what I think, and, and that people have told me that too, that it feels like that. I've, I've, I've listened to it, Chuck. It is very diverse, and I like that. That's one of the things I like about it, because at this stage, how long have you been a professional musician? Oh my God, over 40 years. Yeah, it, it, after 40 years experience, it should be diverse. Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know what? When I started this, I had no intention of doing a solo record. I was just right because of COVID and being shut in, I just had the time to sit and compose for myself. And so I was just composing songs that came to me or like something influenced me, like the pandemic, for instance, influenced me with looking at the apocalyptic feel of the whole world so i wrote weight of silence and and um which is the opening track and, and i recorded it all myself i put out a, a video of it and um troy lucetta from from tesla reached out and said hey it would sound great i love that track it would sound great with drums so he recorded it. and alan hines who's a top um jazz fusion guitar player here same thing um he's a friend contact man i loved it so he sent me some solo stuff so i re-edited it and put that out and it actually won best instrumental and um and best video, which I put the video together myself too, uh, at the Rock Music Alliance Awards, um, and I was up against Joe Satriani and John Five, and uh, presented by Tony K of Yes, and it, it's you know very very cool surprise. I had no idea it was even nominated, but um, because of the fact that I wasn't trying to please anybody but myself, basically, yeah. <laughs> it just said, but I just was recording music, so. On the record, you're going to hear hard rock, you're going to hear funk, you're going to hear prog, you're going to hear jazz fusion, folk, gospel, and I even have a Celtic piece on there with fiddle, three drummers playing tribal drums, and my friend David Victor, who sang with Boston, uh, sang the track, and, it, and it's it's really different and cool, and definitely could be in a movie. You know, a lot of the stuff I think, uh, I've been told by a lot of people, hey, this should be in a movie. But yeah, it's different, and a lot of my influences over the years, of course, show up you know so i got five tracks finished and a bunch in different stages of being finished and i did a video for my cover of bjork's army of me and i thought to myself i go wow i think i got something here maybe a label would be interested and sure enough uh, my friend brian Pereira over at cleopatra records uh -huh. um, dug it and, and saw my vision and um you know he said yeah i'll put it out so i actually have you know hard product cd it's not just something i'm doing myself uh even though it came out basically the beginning of june it, it, nowadays with sixty thousand songs being released a day on spotify and the competition just to get heard is is really tough so i'm still reaching out because i just feel like i've scratched the surface you know and and i found that when people discover the album they're really surprised every actual review i've had has been amazing off the charts like oh, the album of the year whatever i'm being considered for a grammy right now for it which another big shocker to me wow um, yeah yeah so it, it it's just because it just came from the heart it just came from art for art's sake that's all it was about you know it wasn't about oh man i gotta have this three minute single <laughs> whatever you know although i had some pretty short songs but that's the point is is there was no agenda it was just i'm just gonna make cool music and get my friends involved and i would call up a guy and say that i thought would be perfect for a particular part and say check this out man do you want to play on it and they all did um you know there wasn't you know, it was all just volunteer. You know, yeah, I'd love to play on it kind of attitude. Are, all all the really good people, you know. Chuck, are you more nervous about the release of this because it's a solo album than a band album? Um, I, I wasn't, I'm not, I wasn't nervous at all about putting this out. I wanted it to be, you know, I have no delusional, you know, <laughs> I think it's going to be this big, huge thing. But um, I, I really wanted people to know it that don't know me you know i mean a lot of people don't know i produced a couple reggae records and an ambient trance record and I, i've done country records and and even 
um, hardcore with a send off from Cypress Hill, some rap rock kind of music. And, you know, they don't know, a lot of people don't know all that about me. And, and this album kind of speaks to what I'm about um, as a musician, songwriter, um, you know, and vision and all of that. Um, and it, for me, it's my legacy as opposed to, and I know it's, it's a big thing, but you know, the bang your head, uh, that's 1983, mm. you know, that's, this is my, for me, this is my legacy. I wanted to finally have something that spoke to what I'm about musically. Um, and I, that's why I was so pleased that, you know, Hey, wow, I finally have something here. It looks, you know, and somebody wanted to actually put it out. Tell me, Chuck, about, you would have had a wish list of performers you probably wanted on this, and a lot of them you probably already knew, but maybe there was some on it you didn't really know that well, and that, you know, you needed someone that you knew to contact them and get them on. Was there was there some of that? Um, no, I just reached out to people I knew, good friends. I mean, I would love to have Jeff Beck and Vinnie Cayuta playing on my yeah, record, yeah. you know. <laughs> I'm going to go see Jeff Beck. I'm going to go see Jeff Beck in a few days, but because uh, he's my favorite guitar player, and Vinny's my favorite drummer and to, to be able to play with that band would be a dream come true. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, there's, there, sure. There's people out there that I would love to have gotten involved, but, um, because I've made so many good friends over the years and because of my event called ultimate jam night that I started in 2015, which has had well over 2000 professional musicians. I've made a lot of, a lot of new friends too, you know, um, through that event. Which continues on. We're doing another show on December sixth at the Whiskey A Go Go. Mm. You know, yeah. what, you know what I love about the the Ultimate Jam Night. I love the whole idea of it, that musicians want to get together to jam with other musicians. That you hear over the years. Uh, I've heard it in interviews, magazines, and and all that. That you know, musicians all all they're on about was money. You know that that's all that interests them now. And yet you have something like this where. It's maybe bringing the innocence back a little bit to why musicians got into it in the first place was to play with other people. Exactly, um, and I don't charge a cover. You know, it's for the music community. And and um, when it started, it was like DJs were starting to take over, and there was no scene for the musicians. And and hence then, we, there's like little jams all over, but nothing run like ours or at the level. Um, of the musicians that, that play um, Ultimate Jam Night. But it basically, it's so great seeing uh, people like meet for the first time and then they're on stage playing together and they have certain magic or actually putting the people together that haven't seen each other in years. I, I put together um, one show. I had um, Sugarfoot Moffat, the drummer, and Greg Wright, the guitar player, that both did the Michael Jackson Thriller Tour. And they hadn't seen each other since. And I got a hold of both of them and said, hey, do you guys want to come down and, and play? you know, and, and got them to come down and do some tunes. It was, it was awesome. Things like that are great, you know, and also watching the growth of young musicians. We found a guy by the name of Derek Day, who was a busker um, on Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica. We thought he was brilliant. We brought him in. He's playing, he's getting seen, and he just, he just played at the forum fronting uh, Dave Grohl and the Motley Crue guys for the, for that, um, the Hawkins show that they yeah. did, you know, the Bennett Taylor Hawkins show. Yeah. I mean, Watching these young guys go from, you know, just that level of just trying, hey, look at me, I'm, you know, playing for money on the street to, you know, fronting the biggest names in the business. It's been very, that to me is the biggest reward. You know, I just watching that and trying to help people along and, and move things forward for their careers because it's harder than ever right now. I used to always say, boy, I'd hate to be a solo artist right now or an independent artist right now. And then sure enough, I've got my own thing, you know. <laughs> for, the, for the Ultimate Jam Night, do you even get musicians reaching out to you saying, hey, can I do this? I do. I have I have people reach out all the time and say, hey, I heard you guys are playing and doing this, um, whatever it is, uh, you know, whatever show. We, we do themes. Um, in general, there's always a theme, like the one coming up on December 6th is Guitar Heroes. So, you know, we'll be, come, we'll be covering Hendrix and Page and Jeff Beck and, and, the, and you know, all the, the those guys. I mean, you could do like five shows with Guitar Heroes, but I'm talking about like the, the ones that everybody, you know, right away are going to mention. Even Dimebag, we're doing a couple of his, a couple of Pantera tunes. Mm. Um, is it, do you sit in on all the shows? Do you play with? Oh, is there, is if there... I'm in town, yeah, I'm a, we have a, thing, a house band. Yeah, and um, originally my house band, well, it still is Joe Travers, who who uh, 
played with Duran Duran. He played with um, the Zappa. He still does Zappa, uh, does Zappa um, and the Zappa band. Amazing. And Eric Johnson and, and uh, Satrani, he's played drums for. He's an amazing drummer. And Mitch Perry, who's been a friend of mine for, yeah. you know, decades, mm-hmm. was my house guitar player. Um, and Walter Eno uh, played keyboards for us with, with Eagles of Death Metal and also played with Survivor. Um, you know, house band guys. And, and I've had uh, Polly Z as my MC and uh, he sang, um, who's from the, he was in the suite and um, he's got a new thing called Bohemian Queen and he's not doing it any longer, but um, he was with us for quite a few years being the main guy. And we would do, we would do, um, so the house bands, we do like maybe five or six songs as a house band. We start the show, we play in the middle and we're at the end and we also play with other people. So I usually, if I'm there, I'm playing, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's always fun to, too, to do songs that you've always wanted to play because I can say what song we're going to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I can say, hey, I want to do that Jeff Beck song, you know, but I got to find the guys that can pull it off, right? So mm. it, it, it's... Uh, it, 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 must be, it must be great for you as a musician to jam with all these different guys. It kind of keeps your chops up in a way. Well, it, it is. And everybody has a different thing. And I've actually, like... Um, I'm, I'm like now a go-to guy where people call me and contact me about, hey, I need a so-and-so, I need a drummer, I need a bass player, blah. and I've, I've been able to get guys um, into bands, you know. Right. Um, for instance, just now I, I got a guy into the um, Steve Adler's band playing bass, um, Daniel Sprewell, who played with, he plays with Phil X, and um, I thought he'd be really good for that, and um, sure enough, he got the gig. And there's been a lot of other examples of that as well. And, and uh, like I said, it's been great watching uh, musicians go on to uh, – one of our bass players is, is out there with um, – oh, God, what's the guy's name? The uh, lead singer Queen now. Oh, Adam, Adam Lambert. Lambert. She's, she's, out, she's out playing bass with Adam Lambert. You know, yeah. Now. And people, you know, people have been seen there. And, and they, you know, it's all – like anything, it's making connections and social. Like some people don't even know how good of a musician you are. So like what I try to tell guys is listen, I go, no one's going to know how good you are, or how you play sitting on the couch, watching Netflix, come on out, join in the fun. Cause it's a back, you know, backstage is always fun. It's crazy. And, um, you know, you play and it's organized. I mean, everybody knows when they're going to play, what song they're going to play. If it's what tuning it is. And I even send them a video of the way it's supposed to end. If it doesn't have an ending, hmm. you know, so it's, it's pretty, you know, and I have a really good team of people around me. Um, I have uh, my partner in it, Adam Mandel, and, and a girl by the name of Jessica Chase does my social media. And she's also an agent, too, for, um, you know, rock, rock bands. And, and uh, so it's, it's a really good team. I have a great crew. And, um, you know, it's, it's not exactly as you said earlier. It's not for money. Yeah definitely that's it's a free love, show that's what, that's what i love about i love the idea of this the, 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 just the idea of it to get all these musicians oh, yeah. together that want to play with other musicians yeah they just want to get together and and do it you know yeah some guys are picky you know there are guys hey you know uh, dude i want to play with the cats <laughs> you know <laughs> and, and there's some people that have if they have any kind of attitude they're just not asked back Okay. You know, everybody, they added, most everyone is just excited to be there and, and they're very thankful and, and boy, that was fun or that was great. And, uh, you know, sometimes there's problems. Once in a while there's a train wreck, but very, very rare. You know, like somebody's, the tuning's in E flat and no one told them or something, you know, like they didn't read the notes they get or whatever. <laughs> and they're too normal. Huh? Anyway, that's happened a couple of times. Uh, I remember Doug, Doug Pennick was down there and, the guitar player was tuned in, in standard, and he was down. And this is like he stopped there. He goes, "Stop!" No! <laughs> you know. Have you ever so. had any any musicians up on stage with you that for the jam night that you've played with in the past? Maybe Doug Aldrich or the House of Lords. Yeah, that's, sure. Pretty much most of the guys I've, I've worked with in my past have joined. We do this. Um, we oh, over the years we we do. Um, uh, if people don't know, there's a thing called NAM, which is a National Association of Music Merchants, and it's a huge event in Anaheim, California, where like musicians fly in from all over the world. And so we started doing Ultimate Jam Night, our NAM version of it down there, because there were so many guys there, it was easy to say, "Hey, you want to play?" And um, one of the things we did is um, for the second, 
try to get the Eat Him and Smile band together with, with Steve Vai and, yeah. and Greg Bissonette and, and um, my late friend Brett Tuggle and and Billy Sheehan. And uh, we actually had that band ready to go with David Lee Roth sitting in the green room, but the club kept letting in so many people. And this was pre-us moving to the Whiskey A Go-Go, mm-hmm. um, that, that the fire marshal shut it down before they could start playing. <laughs> oh, you no. Know? And Steve Vai goes, I'll pay the fine. And then they go, it's 50 grand. He goes, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, yeah. So the NAM, yeah, you're, you're able to, I mean, Doug played it, you know, I mean, he, that's a good example of what I'm talking about. So yeah, there's, I pretty much, you know, Ken Mary, who I've done was with House of Lords and I've done other records in Pelletary and, and all mm. that with, um, he's done it. He's flown in from Arizona to do it. Okay. okay. Yeah. I just want to swing back to the, 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 the Sheltering Sky album for a couple of minutes, Chuck, and I've yeah. got a few more questions. I want to Great. ask you about Pat Torpy and Lanny. Because um, I remember when the Mr. Big actual size record came out, you, Lanny, and Pat had co-writes on a couple of songs. And I'm thinking, were you three guys trying to get a band together back then? Is that is that how these songs came about? Or did well, you know actually... We have um, two albums out. Um, it's called Odd Man Out um, with Pat Torpy, um, and he's the lead singer on it, and we have a bunch of different guests playing on it, but it's all songs that we co-wrote. But not going back that far, um, uh, we would get together in, uh, at Pat's. Pat had a studio um, over his garage in the back of the house, and the three of us would get together and just jam out ideas, you know? We did a bunch of music, for a sound library for movies okay. um, together. And um, what happened was, is I was looking for something else, a music file. So I'm going through old, old like thumb drives or whatever. I can't remember exactly, but it files on my computer. And I found some songs that we started that never finished. They just had drums, bass and rhythm guitar. One of them had our, our version of army. And me had um, some guitar soloing on it. So to me, the songs blew me away. And I just go, you know what? I want to honor Pat, and I think these songs need to be finished. So um, I finished them, and that's that's why they appear on the album. Mm. Um, of course, Lanny is in is it Afghanistan? He's in now, isn't it? Actually, he's in Pakistan um, because it, because of you know the Taliban taking the country over, and he he went there some years ago and started a music school for young girls, yeah, a guitar, you know, a guitar school, which I mean. Lanny turned into Gandhi, you know. It's, it's, if you knew him like I did in the eighties, it's such a complete turnabout. Well, turn. you see, that, that was the question I was going to ask you, Chuck. When he left House of Lords, did you get a sense that this this is what he wanted to do in the future at all? No, not at all. Not I mean, at all. In the in in the nineties, we did many many album projects together, and we actually did seven film scores together, working with him and Matt Sorum. Um, you know, independent films, and <clears throat> I actually did one big one on Universal with Matt called Call the Conqueror, but but some of my favorite records, um, mid-90s, a thing called Chaos is the Poetry I did with Lanny and, and Greg Bissonette, the drummer on it, is killer. We had a thing called Magdalene uh, that Ken Mary's on that's also killer, but it's really, you know, eclectic and different, you know. Um, we were uh, doing that during the 90s. As you know, in the 90s, when Grunge took over, it's like, it was over pretty much for the for the eighties type of rock bands. So I yeah. remember doing this. I was I did do um, like I think ninety four ninety five with Quiet Riot. We put out an album and and I toured with them and it was like we were doing small clubs, you know, back then. So it really it turned around. But Lanny, all of a sudden, I don't know what drew him to it, but he he changed and and became you know like this this guy. And um, he actually got Brian Wilson and Sammy Hagar. And all these different people involved and did videos with the girls playing guitar and them, you know, filming their parts. And he's got videos out. It's called the Miraculous uh, Love Kids and dot um, org. And people can certainly donate to that to that cause. And he's right now he was able to. It took him six to eight months, I think, to get the girls out of Afghanistan and safe in Pakistan. Now he's trying to find them homes. Um, wherever, if it, whether it be England or, or Europe or the United States, he's just trying, you know, I mean, the guy, you know, come on. It's amazing. That's amazing. He should get, a, he should get the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It is absolutely amazing that he's doing yeah. that. Yeah, but yeah, you know what, and 
I have videos for a couple of those songs, um, but he couldn't be here, obviously. So, so um, you know, a lot of his parts are, are being covered by somebody else, and, and uh, like the rhythm parts. Mm. I want to I want to ask you about the song you wrote on the record after Frankie Benali died. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. See so you on the other side. You yeah. Mean? Yeah. Um, but I want to. I'm going. I'm going to kind of phrase it a little bit differently. The question. I want you to tell me a funny story about Frankie. Something that you can say on the air that happened with you and him, maybe on the road or in the studio, that made you, that still makes you laugh. Well, uh, <laughs> it's there's many and yeah. a lot of different things have happened over the years. But I'll never forget. I was on. T- we were on tour, and um, my tech comes up to me and he goes. Well, this is during the show. He goes, there's something wrong with your bass. I go, really? I didn't notice it. He goes, yeah, there's something wrong here. Hand it to me. And so I just trusted him that he was noticing something. So I handed it to him and I turned around and Frankie just planted a big pie right in my face <laughs> in front of the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> was he you know, it was like, okay, it was my birthday. I okay. guess that's why I did it. But then, but then, you know, I, you know, I cleaned it all off and we finished the show and um, I went downstairs. I, I washed everything off, and and um, and and we're just all chatting. And the next thing I know, there's an actual real cake, and he smashed that one in my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. But um, you know what? I with that song, what happened? I got a phone call. You know that he passed, and it was. I knew it was going to come, but yeah. you just never know when it's going to come. And then when it came, I just had all these feelings rush forward from like losing my mom and, and like five of my best friends like Pat Torpy and John Purdell and, and others that I've worked with are just good guys that were like my brothers and um, five or six of them and it just all rushed to the surface and I sat down with the 12 string right then and there and wrote that song top to bottom including the chorus um, vocal um, lyric and melodies and all that and and um, so it was done and I just finished out the verses with a guy named August Young that Frankie had been working with in a Zeppelin band called Mr. Jimmy. Mm. And I actually got all, I got all of those guys involved in the song um, because, you know, to honor Frankie and it's guys that, that he was just with and close to him. And so that they're in it. I mean, there's five guitar players on that song, but um, yeah, a lot of different people, but um, you know, it's just, it, that's where songs come from. You just never know. I mean, that's, if I wouldn't have got that call, I might not have ever written that song, you know? See, here's one, of the, here's one of the things, Chuck, and I've said this to other musicians before. In a way, I envy you because that's a way you can, you know, release the emotion of, of something like that. That you have that that's gift, cathartic. You have that gift yeah. that you can put it down in a song. And I'm not yeah, a musician and I can't do that. And I kind of envy uh, that. Envy that <laughs> in a way, you know? Right. Well, you know, it's, it's you, you when you're composing, you definitely you usually write from an emotion, uh, emotional place, or maybe you're just jamming on something. But yeah, yeah. it's been a good outlet. I mean, uh, you know, went through a serious breakup and I wrote a song on the House of Lords record called uh, Standing on the Edge of Your Life, uh, which was about that because I really thought this girl was going to, you know, lose it and die or something, you know, so suicide or whatever she was going to do. But it was a really dark period. So things come out for certain reasons with songs and sometimes it's just a, a fun jam and then it turns into something you know mm. but um but that particular song certainly um came from um you know that's that place of loss yeah you know? and this there's some there's a lot you know kind of people mention there's a bit of that um on the record but it's really there's a lot of hope in the record too okay i, I got two more questions chuck and they're both house right. of lords related and then i'll leave you go the first question right. i want to know is what did you learn from Andy Johns when he did House of Lords? What did I learn from him? Yeah. Is that he tells a lot of freaking stories. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're in the studio trying to do a part and he'll stop the machine and go, you know, there was that time that Pagey was like doing this guitar part and, you know, he'll start talking about Jimmy Page or, or Keith Richards or, or whatever, which is great. But when you're, in the, when you're trying to record, you know, he, he was a very unique bigger than life character um maybe you know had a few too many beverages if you know what i mean yeah um major drinker and that was a problem but but um super talented and he really knew his expertise in engineering is really 
what he was about. I mean, we co-produced the record so with ideas, but he would come up, you know, this we should try this tuning against this guitar and try this in this particular mic, and and he had all of that down. He was he was a very brilliant man, and um, and uh, him and Greg would get into it one time when we were doing the Jafria record because I've done three albums with Andy. Him and Greg got into it, and they ended up fighting and wrestling on the floor. <laughs> it was pretty fun. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Wow. You would have to see, you know, Greg's hair flying all over the place. And, <laughs> and Andy's like, you know, like a huge. Yeah, he's, he's a like guy. Shrek. Yeah. He's like Shrek. You know, I remember his big fingers, uh, you know, working the, the console and going, man, his hands are so huge. Hmm. Yeah, that sad, sad that he's no longer with us. And, and his wife, too, just she passed not too long ago. Oh, too. okay. Then, so, so final yeah. question, Chuck. So you're still in touch with James Christian? Um, not as, I mean cordially you know once in a while i mean i never really got over the fact that uh you know we went to england as house of lords to do that live record and all that and, and at the same time he'd already been negotiating a record deal to do his own version of house of lords and took the name and we didn't have the money at that time i do now but we didn't have the money at that time to 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 go into litigation about um using the name you know he just went ahead and did it so um, I, that that always rubbed me wrong, you know. Okay. Um, that he he did that. So and no, he's he's done like uh, what I don't know, ten records since then. So it's kind of like old. It's old news to me. Just came out a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and and uh, oddly enough, you might find this interesting. Frontiers Records reached out to me and asked me to do an album. Um, you know songs that were already written with Jimmy Bell, who I think is a phenomenal guitar player. I, you know, I did shows with him when he was playing with Autograph, and we were friends. And I, I think he's fantastic. And then Ken Mary's the drummer on it. And I originally, I, I passed. I said, well, you know, it's not really. I don't really. I feels like I'm going backwards because you know what I'm doing now musically with my own thing is is on a different plane uh, as far as style and what I'm doing. Mm. But then they sent me the music. And I went, wow, this stuff sounds like, you know, Queen's Rock meets Ho Old House of Lords. It's really good. Most of it, well, at least the first few songs I heard, I thought were really excellent. So I joined in. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm in. And I did that. And that comes out sometime next year. And we just have to coordinate getting everybody together to shoot videos, which is kind of tough when you have the singer, um, James, his James Robling, I can't remember. He's, he's Argentinian, I think. He, he's down in South America and then... You know, Jimmy's in the East Coast, and so everybody's spread out all over, so it's just a matter of coordinating us getting together to do um, some videos for that album. And it's actually for, like I said, it's that style. It's really done well, and that's why I decided to go ahead and do it. Nice. Well, I'm looking forward to that, Chuck. So uh, Yeah, you know what? They called it Demons Down, which I thought was, was funny. <laughs> I thought that was funny because nobody on this album had anything to do with the I know it's the, it's the third album. house of lords record <laughs> yeah I know that's what they, they, they they're you know they want to let people know oh yeah this has to do with how but none of us were on it so it, it's but I have no say so in anything I just played bass on it okay okay so Chuck tell people where they can get a copy of uh, Sheltering Sky and get in touch with you hey well it's Chuck Wright Sheltering Sky it's it's um, it's kind of a project name because I have so many guests on it and it's not like Chuck Wright, Sheltering Sky, Chuck Wright, Sheltering Sky. It can be found everywhere. Spotify, um, iTunes. You, if you want hard product, I suggest Amazon or the Cleopatra a Records website has it. Um, the album cover was done by my good friend Glenn Wexler, who's done Van Halen and, and Black Sabbath and Yes and um, Rush and uh, ZZ Top, on and on and on. He, he just, he's one of my good friends and just said, uh, even though I'm a graphic designer, he uh, offered his services. He goes, hey, I'd love to do it. And I said, if the best of the best wants to do it, you got it. So, um, you know, a lot of people like the package itself. And a lot of people just in general like having hard product and instead of just digital files. So it's everywhere. Um, Chuck Wright, Shelter, and Sky. And there's four videos out too, um, which I'm really proud of on YouTube. Um, besides just the tracks being on YouTube, there are actual music videos that I did that are out there. Nice. Well, Chuck, it's been yeah. a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, nice, nice talking to you too, man. Uh, you know, going in depth with certain things, cool. Yeah, I like that. I always try. I always throw the oddball question in. Well, yeah, you, you threw a couple at me, and I, you know, I hope I did okay. Yeah. All right, Chuck. We'll have a good rest of the day. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.
So again, if you want to pick up Chuck's latest release, Chuck Wright's Sheltering Sky, you can find that up at Amazon or also uh, Cleopatra Records online shop. And there's other places too, Amoeba Records, come other places that have it. So just look it up. They're out there. Grab yourself a copy of that one. So big thanks to Chuck for coming on the show giving us a lot of uh, great info, stories, all that good stuff. And I hope you guys enjoyed this one. And uh, no idea what's up for next week. Could be a discussion. Maybe we'll continue on the maiden journey. I don't know. You know, we're getting into this November, December time frame. And if we were busy as fuck before, um, it's just totally blown out of the water when you start talking about November, December. Rest assured, though, we'll get something in the pipeline for you and pumped into your little metal ear holes. But until then, that's it. There ain't no more. Stick a fork in it. This puppy is done. So for Richie, myself, and everybody else here at Focus on Metal, have yourselves a great metal week. And until we talk to you again next time, as always, remember... Focus on Metal! is insignificant. Still here? It's over. Go home.